Hey everybody, it's Mr. Kite coming back to you again for the Lab 207 webcast. Today we wrap up our series on cells with a little discussion about transport. So it's been a long day for me, I'm sure it's been a long day for you. Let's go ahead and get in this and get it going with our objectives. So first thing I need you to know by the end of the video, compare and contrast passive and active transport and provide examples of each. Next thing for you, explain how membrane potential is maintained and finally, Describe co-transport and bulk transport. Our first major topic for the day is passive transport. Just a couple of quick points to know about this. It is moving materials across the cell membrane without any energy investment. This is using diffusion to its fullest potential. So you've got everything moving down the concentration gradient, high to low, just like we talked about in the last video. Just recognize the cell doesn't have to put any energy into making this happen just kind of naturally and of course it's going to happen only with molecules that can diffuse easily across the cell membrane. Now that's not always the case. In some cases you need to use facilitated diffusion. Recognize that this is still a type of passive transport because the molecules are moving with the concentration gradient but if you take a look at my little diagram there on the right hand side you'll see that in this case there are little pores or channels that help things to get through. So let's say you've got a molecule that the cell needs but it's too big to easily diffuse across the cell membrane. It's going to travel through one of those little channels or pumps. Even if the facilitated transport down there on the bottom you can see it's a little pump that's moving back and forth. Even though it's moving back and forth, molecules are still moving with the gradient, so there is no input of energy. And then the one up there on the top is just like a little tunnel that they can flow through. A good example of the top one would be an aquaporin, which is a tunnel that water molecules flow through since they don't easily diffuse across the cell membrane. Active transport, on the other hand, is a completely different story, and your body has to use this quite a lot. What active transport does is it moves sol solutes, forgive me, it moves solutes against the concentration gradient, and this is carried out by pumps. So where passive transport runs downhill with the concentration gradient, active transport pumps things against the gradient. So passive transport moves from high to low, active transport runs in the other direction and goes from low to high. Now. The reason that this is important is it takes energy to make this happen. Passive transport's a freebie. Your cells can just use the laws of physics to make that happen. Active transport, not so much. It actually has to spend energy to run that pump to pump things against the concentration gradient. Now, active transport is used for many things. One of those things is to maintain membrane potential. And let me get my points up and then we'll chat about it. First thing to know about membrane potential is it's a difference in electrical charge across a membrane. So on our membranes, you can have something set up where the outside of the membrane might be positive and the inside of the membrane negative. That is set up through one of these pumps. And your body can use that difference in charge, positive, negative, in order to make work happen. Um, like it says on that bottom point, this provides energy to do work. As far as our cell, like our body cells are concerned, in general, the inside of the cell is negative, which means that cations would like to enter because cations are positive, positive and negative, they want to hook up. So since the inside of the cell is generally negative, it makes positive ions want to enter. And this potential, this membrane potential, is maintained using electrogenic pumps. So these are a form of active transport pumps that pump ions to one side or the other depending on what the body needs in terms of electrical charge. One of the best known electrogenic pumps that you'll see throughout your science career is the sodium potassium pump. And it maintains both an electrical and a chemical gradient. So what this does is it pumps sodium ions out of the cell and potassium ions into the cell and it kind of runs in a little circle that separates this thing out so there's a charge. Your body wants to set up a situation where there's a lot of sodium on the outside and there's a lot of potassium on the inside and then it's going to use that difference to do work. So there are some actions in your body whereby you've got your gradient set up and then your body will throw up a little gate. All of the ions will rush in through diffusion and as they rush back and forth that can actually provide some energy to do work for the cell. So note, sodium potassium pump, it sets up both an electrical and a chemical gradient. Electrical because it sets up a difference in charge on each side of the membrane. Chemical because there's a chemical difference on each side of the membrane and that takes energy in order to work. Next thing that you need to know about in terms of active transport is called co-transport. 
And this is kind of like a coworker situation. If you look on the top there, you've got a proton pump. He is pumping H plus ions out of the cell. And then down below that, there is an example of a co-transporter. It's a sucrose co-transporter. And what happens in this situation is all of those H plus ions are going to rush down through the pump. As they bond to the pump, when one of the H's bonds to the pump, sucrose is able to also bond to the pump, and then they go through together. So it's kind of like a friend going up to a doorman and saying, hey, he's with me, he's cool, and go inside. So in this case, energy is being spent to use the proton pump, which sets up an electrical gradient. And then that gradient provides the energy for the co-transporter to do its work. As those H pluses rush in, they allow the sucrose to go in with them also. Now, if we want to deal in bigger things, not so much little ions, we're going to be talking about bulk transport. Now, first form of bulk transport is known as exocytosis. And there's a little diagram there. So this would be the cell releasing I don't know, it could be proteins, could be anything. You got a little vesicle full of whatever the cell is trying to get rid of. It travels up there, it bonds with the cell membrane. Once it bonds with the cell membrane, it opens up and expels whatever needs to go out, and then the vesicle becomes part of the cell membrane. So two things have happened. One, the cell membrane just grew a little bit, and two, there was stuff expelled from the cell. And our last topic for the day is going to be endocytosis. And this is when your body needs it to take in something that is too big for diffusion. So there are a couple ways it can do it. On the left there you got phagocytosis. This happens when there is a really big molecule. Your cell or the cell, usually an amoeba, recognizes the particle. It sticks out its little arms there. You can see pseudopodia on the left. And sorry for not notating my pen just crapped out on me. But <clears throat> it sticks its arms out gives a big hug to the molecule and pulls it inside, and then that pinches off as a vesicle. That vesicle will go into the cell, and then lysosomes will hook to it and digest it, or the particles will be used somewhere else in the cell. Pinocytosis is used for little molecules, and again, just like in phagocytosis, vesicles are pinching off and coming inside. Last one on the end there is receptor-mediated endocytosis. Now, this is kind of like a directed system that's got tags and labels and stuff. You can see on the surface of the cell there are little green receptors. Those receptors bond up with the little stars. Now what happens is when those stars bond to the receptors and the receptors know, hey, it's time for me to fold inward, and it's going to fold inward. And then notice that on the underside of the stars there are little red spikes sticking out. Those are kind of like a protein coat that tell the cell where this vesicle needs to go. So this one's fully labeled and tagged. The vesicle only forms when the right molecule bonds up with the right receptor. And then once that specific vesicle is formed, it's got little proteins on the outside that dictate where it's supposed to go. So that was a quick run through of transport across the cell membrane. Hope it was helpful to you. Sorry, I didn't have a pen to make funky little drawings all over it. But I hope that you will join us again on the Lab 207 webcast. Have a good day.